Amazing stories of someone who had morals. Spoke gently, lifting compassion banners. Never vacillated to say what's right. His conviction in Islam was eternally bright. Was eternally bright. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. My dear and respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And welcome to this new episode from our series, The Amazing Stories. And we are still with this beautiful story that our beloved Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam informed us about when he said and when he told us that a man had killed 99 different souls. And then he wanted to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asked to be directed to a scholar. And unfortunately, people actually directed him to an ignorant person, someone who is not qualified to answer him. And he told him, no, you cannot repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He got very upset and he killed him. And that was the crime number 100. And then still he wanted to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asked again to be directed to a scholar. And this time, alhamdulillah, he was directed to a knowledgeable person. He told him, can I repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, yes, of course. And who would prevent you? Who would be able to keep you away from repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then he moved to the actual practical side of the advice. He said, Intaliq ila ardi kada wa kada. He said, move away from your town. Move out. Migrate to this specific town it was a specific town that he told him about. It's not very important for us to know which town it was because the Prophet ﷺ did not tell us anything about that. And then he told him, and that was the place where we actually stopped the part of the story. He said, والسلام, that the scholar told him, وَلَا تَرْجِعْ إِلَىٰ أَرْضِكَ فَإِنَّهَا أَرْضُ سُوءٍ He said, do not ever go back to your initial village. As, why? What is the reason behind that? He said, فَإِنَّهَا أَرْضُ سوء. Because it is a land of evil. It is a land that will push you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more. So here, as we have mentioned in our previous episode, my dear brothers and sisters, here the scholar is moving in his fatwa to the second part, which is related to the actual prevention. So this is what you have to do. But at the same time, you have to take your precautions. Meaning, do not go back to your initial town. Why? Because going back to your initial town will destroy your tawbah, will keep you away from the true tawbah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. And this is a lesson for us that whenever we want to change ourselves, specifically if we are talking about a major change, becoming from a person who is completely out of the way and completely away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to someone who is pious and practicing, what we need to do is change our environment. And specifically the actual physical environment. Sometimes we need to move away. Whether it is only moving away from the uh, area in which we live, it can be in the same city, but we move away from one area to another area because the area in which we live is full of disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we are talking about changing the city, sometimes changing the country completely. And that depends, of course, on the actual context of the person and it depends from one person to another. Why is that? Because first of all, if he stayed or if he went back to his initial city, it will remind him Imagine, subhanAllah, in every street that he will walk, he will remember those sins that he did. That in this place, he had killed this person. And in this place, he had a fight with a different person. So maybe he should kill him also, and so on. It will rem remind him of his past, which will push him to make more sins and commit more crimes. Second is going back to your initial town will make you, meaning the man, it will make him meet again his old friends, his old companionship, which was definitely not the best companionship to have. He was probably friends with other people who were criminals like him. 
So they will remind him to do the same thing. They will tell him, what happened to you? How come now you are one of those religious people? Put religion aside. Go back to your initial state. Remember, you were a very strong person. You were a very mighty person. People were scared of you because you were committing crimes and so on. And this will push him to make even more and more and more crimes. And reason number three is the actual state of the city itself. As he told him, فَإِنَّهَا أَرْضُ سوء. It is a land of evil, which means that it was a land of complete disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know, not all the cities on this world are so pious and so pure and so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot compare any city to a city like Mecca, for example, the land, the chosen land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which we have the Kaaba and Masjid al-Haram and millions of people who are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not all the cities have the same level of purity and the same level of being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you give an example to that, they have those people who study in urban studies and how to build cities and how to keep cities clean and developed and everything, they have one of the laws that is relevant to the example of the broken glass, the broken window. Meaning they said that in a beautiful land, if you have a beautiful city, a very clean city, do not ever allow one window to be broken except that you will replace it and fix it as soon as possible. Why? Because at the moment you allow one window to be broken, other people will see that as an example and they will start breaking other windows and so on. And think of the same thing in terms of the actual aspect of being clean, the actual dirtiness. If you go to some city in which you notice garbage everywhere on the floor and on the ground, you will see that maybe even you yourself you will forget yourself and you will eat something, you will eat a cookie or a chocolate or anything like that and you will throw after that the garbage on the floor or on the side. But if you go to a city that's very clean, if you, even if you bring someone who is not very clean, usually they won't do that because they will feel very uncomfortable going against the actual standards in which they are. It's exactly the same thing. When he goes to that city that is so used to committing crimes and killing people and disobedient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will feel more comfortable and more easy doing such a thing. And reason number four is that as we all know, it is very dangerous that if we live amongst those, amongst a big population of people who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we might be punished with them if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And this is why a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once he was asked, they said, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish us and destroy us while there are people who are pious amongst us? He said, alayhi salatu was salam, naam. Yes, when? He said, alayhi salatu was idha kathur al khabath. When there will be so much dirtiness, so much evil in the society and that the good amongst you will not do anything to change that evil, that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a punishment. And on the day of judgment, everybody will be judged according to their intentions and their internal state of the heart. However, in this life, they might be destroyed with them if they were with them and they were pleased what they were doing and they did not do anything to change the evil in which they are. So here we are talking on the actual impact of the environment on the life of the person. So it is a very sensitive issue, my dear brothers and sisters. And here we can talk a little bit also about the issue of hijrah, meaning migration, which is related to this topic as well. That as we know, making hijrah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, migrating from one land to another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can be one of the best and most beloved action to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most beloved ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is needed in one situation, which is the situation in which the one of us will find himself in a land where it is very difficult or even impossible to practice most of the major aspects of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is the case, if that is the case and that we are able to move to another city, to another place, to another land in which we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more easily and with more freedom 
and so on, then we have the obligation in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that, to make that migration. But that, as we have mentioned, with two conditions, if we are in a place where we cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we were asked to do, and the second condition is that we are able to find a better alternative, we are bet able to move away and to move to a different place. And that is not only concerning us, because some of us might find it very easy to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but sometimes we cannot make it easy for our kids, we cannot educate our kids according to the major values of Islam. And if that, the, if that is the case, then we have to think about our kids and try to find a better future for them. And of course, I will close this issue, my dear brothers and sisters, with going back a little bit to our uh, circumstances, because we, are, we have to be realistic in the state in which our ummah is living nowadays. We know that in most of the places on this earth, if not all of them, we cannot practice all of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many aspects for some political or social or any other reason that we can hardly practice. So we have to be realistic. We're not saying here that we have to be able in every place to practice every single aspect of Islam. But we are talking here at least about the major things in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prayer, zakat, fasting, the actual belief, being able to say our belief that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and so on. And prayer, for example, so that is also related to your situation. Sometimes some of our brothers and sisters in the West, they say, I work in a job where they don't let me pray. If they don't let you pray and you are not able to do your prayer, you have the obligation to go out and look for a different job. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way from you, for you. Stay with us and we will be back inshallah ta'ala after the break to continue with our lessons. Wassalamu alaikum. This conviction in Islam was eternally bright, was eternally bright. Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted. So much so that quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Conviction in Islam was eternally bright, was eternally bright. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome back to our show, The Amazing Stories. So we have spoken about the importance of making migration for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also one lesson that we can take from this beautiful hadith, from this beautiful part of the story, is that it is part of wisdom, hikmah, it is part of wisdom that we direct those who are newly practicing in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who became Muslim not too long ago, those who converted to Islam not too long ago, and so on. It is from wisdom to direct them in the beginning of their way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to seek more knowledge, to take more care of the, themselves than being caring for the rest of the society around them when it comes to the actual religious aspect. Why? Because we make, or it happens a lot, that some of our brothers and sisters, they become, for example, newly practicing, although they were Muslims before, but they were not practicing. But after that, right after they become practicing, what do they do? They actually enter in situations of conflicts with their families, with all their relatives, and they start saying, now I'm practicing, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, and they actually show it, and they start debating about every single aspect of Islam. And what happens, my dear brothers and sisters, in many situations, is that because they are weak, they are weak either in their faith or maybe in their knowledge and so on, what happens after that is that those around them will become very upset, 
they will start reacting and making a lot of pressure on them and we will see that that brother or that sister after a short mo moment they will completely leave off the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will completely stop and give up the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because there was a lack of wisdom in the beginning. What the person in such a situation should be directed to is doing the major aspects of Islam, taking care of obedience obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without necessarily showing it off to people, to those around. I'm not saying because it is not good to show our ibadat and to defend our religion, but because it has to be related to wisdom, not that it brings more harm to the person. And then once that person, after two, three years, inshallah ta'ala, they gain much more knowledge, they are much more firm in their faith, then they can go out and go to those around, their families and so on, and tell them about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, debate with them with wisdom and with ikhlas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with mercy to invite them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not saying here, I'm not saying that it's haram for someone who is newly practicing to make da'wah to others and to call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm just saying that it has to be relevant to your context. It has to be made with wisdom. It has to be made with wisdom. And then after that he said alayhi salatu wa salam, فَانْطَلَقَ حَتَّى إِذَا نَصَفَ الطَّرِيقَ and in the other narration, فَأَدْرَكَهُ الْمَوْتِ So the man, right away, he went out. Right away, when he told him this fatwa, he told him what he needs to do, he started practicing. Look, subhanAllah, how important it is that he is showing us, this man, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him and we warn him how important it is to be foremost in good actions, to take opportunity as much as we can, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to do that, as much as we can that when we have an opportunity to do good actions, we take it right away. We take it right away and we make it our priority. Because he did not waste any time. He did not spend many years before he went out. It means right away he left his initial city and he made migration for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we have said, this is called al-hijrah. And he was able to do migration Hijrah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although sometimes it might feel very difficult to do that. Very difficult on ourselves. Imagine someone who would make hijrah. Meaning he will leave behind his family, his relatives, maybe his money, his past, his souvenirs, everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is sacrificing that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why hijrah is such a beautiful and beloved thing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know, the best companions are known to be al-muhajireen, those who made migration for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Mecca to Medina. Some of them were very wealthy, but they left everything behind for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to live with our Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. So only the sincere people are able to do hijrah when they are asked and uh, basically when they need to do it. And at the same time, it shows us how subhanAllah, he obeyed the scholar. Meaning he did not go to ask a fatwa just for the sake of asking it, just for philosophical reasons as we do it in many cases. Unfortunately, it happens to us a lot nowadays that we go, we seek knowledge, we seek information just for the sake of seeking the information. Meaning we are not interested by the actual information when it comes to the practical side, we just want to learn and then that's it. Him, no. He took the information and right away he was able to implement it. And it shows us also that he obeyed the scholar. He obeyed the scholar. The scholar did not force him. He did not tell him, I am able to take away your, your wealth or to impose a tax on you if you do not move from your city. No, he just gave him an advice and he took that advice. Because the true believers, they take the advice when the advice is relevant. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us, and listen to this, my dear brothers and sisters, this is very important, and a lot of people tend to be ignorant about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His religion, one of the obligations is to obey those who are our scholars, is to obey our scholars. Our scholars who ask us only to do things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to obey them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهِ and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولِ and obey the messenger. And who else? وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ And those who are in charge of your affairs. 
A lot of people, they think that this verse is only talking about the leaders, the political leaders, which is not the case. Actually, if you go back to the scholars of tafsir, they said more important than the political leaders, they said, They are the scholars before being the actual political leaders. Why? Because in Islam, in the real political Islam, if it was applied as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to do, we have the political leaders who are there to execute, but we have before all the scholars and the people of knowledge who have to give their orders. They tell the leaders what to do because our scholars, they know they do not invent things. Not that we give them a complete freedom to decide what they want. No, because they take the orders from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So even if our scholars do not have the power of a judge, or a leader, a political leader to force us to obey, our iman, our faith, if it's sincere, has to force us and to make us be able and be interested and be loving in this obedience for them. Because we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they are asking us to do things that please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, a lot of us nowadays, we always say we want Islam to rule. We want Islam to rule in the Muslim countries and we want Islam to be the source. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not giving the, us this opportunity yet, this blessing yet. And why is that? Maybe it's because we don't deserve it. And to give the proof for that is that how many of them or how many of us Muslims nowadays are able and would feel happy when we have conflicts between each other. I have a conflict, a dispute with my neighbor, with my brother who is my neighbor, about something, for example, that is related to our neighborhood life or to our business that we are doing together. We have a dispute. How many of us would be willing to say, let's go and ask a qualified scholar and whatever he says to do, we will apply it, whether or it's against me or whether it's against you. Whether it's for me or for you, we will take the decision and we will apply it. How many of us will be able to do that? Very few maybe. Why? Because we are able to only obey if there is a power, if there is a fine, if there is prison or jail behind it. But what if there is hellfire behind it? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making us choose between paradise and hellfire. So it's very important to obey our scholars. And only at that state will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change the state of our nation of the Muslims in this world. And subhanAllah, one other thing, and that's also very important to take as a deduction and as a lesson and as a reflection from this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, فانطلق. So he left. حتى إذا نصف الطريقة. After that, when he exactly reached half of his way, meaning between the first land and the second land, he was exactly in the middle. What happened? Atahul Maut. He died. Death came to him. And subhanAllah, do you think this man ever thought that he would die in that place? Maybe that he never visited before, maybe in the middle of a desert? Probably not. Probably not. And this reminds us of a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he told us, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ قَبْضَ رُوحِ عَبْدٍ بِأَرْضٍ he said والسلام, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take away, to give the death to the soul of one of his servants in one specific land, he will make him have a need in that land. He will make him have a need in that land. I remember once in a city in which I lived, there was this uh, event, this accident that happened. There was a couple, a man and a woman. And they were just about to get married. So they said, let's go tonight. We are going to go to a restaurant together. And subhanAllah, they say exactly this story just like this. So they went to a restaurant and then when they arrived, the man who works in the restaurant, they said, please proceed to this table. Go to this table. The lady, she said, no, I do not want that table. I want that table that is in the corner. I want to sit there. He said, fine, if you want to sit there, go ahead. So she went with her husband and they took that table and a few moments after there was a huge rock, a huge rock that fell. It was a rock of concrete that fell from the building upstairs 
and it fell right on her and she was killed and her husband did not die. Subhanallah, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a reason because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was written in the Qadr that she will die in that table, in that place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made her without knowing, she said, I want to go to that place. My need is that specific table. So he died in that place and he did not have the chance to be able to complete his tawbah and to move out to the second land and start worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those who were pious. So what happened to him? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him enter hellfire? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish him? We are talking about something really serious here, my dear brothers and sisters. Someone who killed a hundred people. And then after that, he never had the chance to live for many years and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him and to make so many prayers, to make so many invocations, to give sadaqah, to fast, maybe to go for pilgrimage and to go to the families of those victims and apologize to them and so on. So what happened after that? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish him? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him enter hellfire? Because as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that the one who kills people who are innocent, then his punishment that he deserves is Jahannam, hellfire, khalidan fiha. For very long time he will stay in hellfire. Let's say and let's see what happened to this man, inshallah ta'ala, in our next episode. So be with us and we'll meet you again. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I love the prophet who struggled so hard When his mission was just a start He held the hands of each companion On shame to play with little children With little children Amazing stories of someone who had morals Spoke gently, lifting compassion banners Never vacillated to say what's right His conviction in Islam was eternally bright Was eternally bright